So yeah, I'm, I'm a science presenter and I, I present science shows for stage and for TV. And so I'm always on the lookout for new ideas, new experiments, new demos that I can show people. And it's an amazing feeling when one comes along and you think, yes, I know this is going to work. I know this is going to work on stage or on TV. And that happened fairly recently. Something turned up and I thought, this is brilliant. This is going to work. But there was a problem. And the problem was, I had no idea how it worked. I had this physical effect that I couldn't explain. And as a science presenter, that's not great. <laughs> if you're going to present something, you should probably try and explain it as well. Um, and so um, I'm, it kind of uh, launched me on a, on a journey. And that's what I want to talk about. I'm going to talk about how I came to that point and then what happened afterwards. And uh, to give you some background, I studied physics at university. And at the same time, I started doing stand-up comedy. Guess which is harder? Um, if comedy is much harder. Um, and, and it, which is sort of maybe a weird mix. But uh, when I graduated, I got a job in technology. And I sort of carried on doing stand-up comedy on the side as, you know, uh, so I had a day job and, and, and did stand-up comedy, which was fun, but uh, I started to kind of miss the science, and, and it occurred to me maybe I could combine my love of science with stand-up comedy. Is that something that can be done? And, uh, and fast forward to the present day, yes, it can be done, and of course I've been on tour with Festival of the Spoken Nerd doing our weird science comedy thing, and it seems to work. It's a real thing. Um, so, so it's weird, but... Um, It's, it's weird because I'm standing on a trapdoor, and that was kind of a trapdoor noise, wasn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but to, to go back to when I sort of uh, was first trying to do this thing, I was building up uh, shows for kids and trying to persuade people that they should book me. And I got one or two gigs, and it was great. And, and then I remember I got a phone call from someone saying, can you do a chemistry show? for some school kids, for some GCSE kids? And the answer to that question is no. I cannot do a chemistry show because I didn't study chemistry and I don't have access to a chemistry lab. I can't get cool things like liquid nitrogen. People won't let me buy dangerous chemicals. <laughs> it can't happen. And I, and I explained it to them. I said, yeah, sure, I can do a chemistry show. Um, <laughs> right? Fake it till you make it, you know? And also, there were some really good people on the bill. And I thought, well, I've got to be on the same bill as these people. So I said, I'll do it. And I thought, I'll worry about the details later. <laughs> I thought, you know, I can't do a chemistry show now, but give me a few weeks. <laughs> I'll come up with something. Um, and so I, I said yes, and I panicked. Um, and I thought about it a lot, and I, I realized what I could do is I could do a, a, a chemistry show about polymers, because polymers that's like plastic and rubber and that sort of thing, stuff that I can get hold of, and I don't need to be a chemistry professor to be able to get this stuff. So I worked on a show about polymers, and, and uh, obviously polymers are amazing, is what I discovered. And I, and I had a whole show full of demonstrations and experiments about polymers, and I was really happy with it. Um, except there was something missing, and, and the thing that was missing was there was no way for the audience to visualize what a polymer really was. I felt like I needed a visual aid. And I'd seen people using chains of beads, like Mardi Gras beads, or like Christmas plastic Christmas tree beads, as a sort of visual aid for polymers. Because polymers are really, really long molecules. That's, that's what a polymer is. So a chain of beads works really well. And I kind of thought, OK, I'll, I'll get some of those. But I'm not going to get plastic ones. I'm going to get metal ones. Because metal ones are fancy. And I'm fancy, and my show's going to be fancy. So I got a hold of some of these metal beads. And these are, um, these are the kinds of beads that you would see like, uh, in office blinds. So you know, uh, it, the things you pull on to make the blinds open and close. And this is 50 meters of, of that. And um, there are 8,000 individual beads, uh, one uh, long chain of 50 meters like that. Now, even this doesn't quite stretch to being like a polymer. A polymer has tens of thousands of repeating units. And this only has 8,000. Um, so it's all right, uh, but um, I kind of I, so I put these, this chain in a pot like this, and 
I thought, great, I've got a sort of thing that people can look at, and it kind of reminds them of a polymer, maybe, like under a microscope. And then I noticed something really weird, which I will show you now. This is a, a stage that mechanically uh, rises and lowers, and there's um, a slight gap. So if the chain were to go down that gap, it would all start again, and uh, I would never see the chain again, which is why there's a, a, a grey sort of uh, pot down there. Um, <laughs> and yes, yeah, so this is, I kind of, this is something that needs explaining. There's two things that need explaining here. The first thing is, why, do the chain, why does the chain leave the pot? in its entirety, just with that little uh, first thing. That actually can be ex explained quite easily, and in fact, the same thing happens with plastic beads, and I saw this being done, um, uh, and it, it basically, I'll, I'll explain it. It's sort of a tug of war, so you've got the, this length of chain that's hanging outside of the pot, um, pulling the chain outwards, and on the inside, you've only got a short bit. You've got a short kind of bit of loose chain that's, that's pulling it back in. So this heavier length of chain will always win that tug of war. And so the chain will empty out entirely. And it turns out there's a polymer that does a very similar thing, polyethylene oxide. And, uh, and it's a self-siphoning polymer, so it's a brilliant thing you can do. But something that only happens with the metal beads and doesn't happen with the plastic beads is that the chain, hopefully you saw it, rises above the pot before it drops down. What? <laughs> And so, you know, it, it's just, it was begging for an explanation. And I thought about it a lot, and I asked some people that I know, you know, some smart people, and I couldn't figure out uh, what, what was going on, why it did this. So I had an idea. I thought, I'll make a YouTube video. Because if enough people see this video, then eventually I'll receive an eloquent explanation in the comments. <laughs> It turns out I've really misunderstood YouTube. Uh, <laughs> but I've learned a lot, actually. I've learned that my experiment is fake and gay. Uh, <laughs> I've been told a lot of things about my mum that I didn't know. Um, but uh, but it, it, it went viral, which is great. It's, it's had one and a half million hits, uh, which is great. It's not quite otters holding hands, but it's pretty cool. Um, and it was discussed on Reddit, which, as a nerd, is like, I mean, it was on the front page of Reddit, right? Like, that's, yeah, well, thanks very much. Um, uh, and it's, so, uh, just a brief discussion on uh, Ask Science there. Not, not, uh, not too much, but uh, <laughs> and, uh, I, I, f I followed this debate, and um, I don't think they got to the bottom of it. So I was kind of stuck again, and I thought, OK, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to film it in slow motion. And then I can sort of pour over the footage and work out what's going on. So I asked around, does anyone have a slow motion camera? And eventually, a, a company called Earth Unplugged got in touch. They said, come and film it with us. So ladies and gentlemen, I can present to you, in slow motion, beads coming out of a pot. Uh, <laughs> Isn't that glorious? <laughs> Wonderful arcing motion uh, there. Also, we caught this amazing thing as well. I don't think it happened just now, but um, look at this wonderful, like, you get these, yeah, that's right. <laughs> you get this sort of like corkscrew effect, and now it's going backwards. What? Uh, not really. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to loop the video. But anyway, so, uh, yeah, but the sort of corkscrew is frozen in space. You get these weird effects. Um, so, yes, I, I poured over this footage and I eventually worked out a slow motion video doesn't help. <laughs> um, but this, this video, um, uh, if you search for Earth Unplugged YouTube channel, you'll find it. It's uh, the video with the most views uh, on that channel. Uh, it's, uh, uh, this has had two and a half million hits uh, and it actually it came to the attention of some academics in Cambridge. And uh, they decided to apply their mighty brains to it. And in fact, they wrote a paper about it. Uh, Understanding the Chain Fountain by Biggins and Warner. Isn't that great? And uh, look, shorter than the discussion on Reddit. There we go. Uh, 
And, uh, and while we're looking at the references, look, there's me. Yes! <laughs> In the references. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, they're, they're sort of insights into... Uh, I'm going to try and explain this to you now, because they, they basically worked it out. Their insight was to look at the chain and look at how flexible the chain is. And it, it is very, very flexible, uh, but only up to a certain point. And if you pinch it beyond a certain point, it becomes rigid. So it's a chain that is flexible up to a point, and then it becomes uh, rigid. So they looked at the mathematics of that, and they realized that the mathematics of that uh, are very hard. <laughs> so um, they ignored it and imagined something easier. Uh, <laughs> Which is, this is what you do in physics, right? If it's too hard, imagine something easier. Uh, and so they imagine a, a simplified version of this chain. And the simplified version is um, rigid sections joined by flexible links. So uh, rigid, flexible, rigid, flexible. So basically, uh, a chain of rods like this. So imagine uh, this sort of chain carries on up here like this. It's being pulled into motion. So this rod is already in motion. This bit of rod here is about to be pulled into motion by this one. So this is in the pot. This is coming out of the pot. We can look at the forces involved here, right? So it's going to be pulled up from this end, but the center of mass is here, like this, which means that when it eventually moves, it doesn't just rise up, but it also rotates like that. So that a part of the rod ends up lower than where it was before. But that can't happen. That's not allowed to happen because there's stuff in the way. The, the rest of the pile of rods or the, the bottom of the beaker, there's something in the way preventing that from happening. So instead, it pushes against the pile and it feels an opposite force pushing back up. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So Biggins and Warner's kind of bizarre conclusion is that the reason the chain rises above the pot is because it's pushed by the pot. It's an amazing. I, I, uh, I stole. The, I've stolen this explanation from them. Uh, they let me, but um, I, I've stolen it uh, from their video. They made a video to accompany the paper. If you search for "Understanding the Chain Fountain" on YouTube, you'll see their full video. It's brilliant. I want to play a little section of the video to you. This is um, Mark Warner talking about the project. We wanted to see whether or not we could blend this uh, research project because nobody understood the mold effect. Oh, now, hold on, let me just... Uh... <laughs> let me just play that again. Because nobody understood the mould effect. <laughs> the mould effect. I have an effect. I don't think even Einstein has an effect. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> My, uh, my wife's pregnant, and uh, I, was, you know, I used to be worried that if I have kids, it's going to be tough at school, having a surname like Mould. But now, I mean, <laughs> like, what, Mould? As in the Mould effect. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's going to be great. Um, this, uh, this, is a, this is a good theory uh, for the, the chain fountain. And when I say it's a good theory, what I mean is uh, it passes certain tests. And one of the tests that it passes is that it's, it makes testable predictions. It's falsifiable. Their theory is falsifiable. It can be probed. And one of the predictions that it makes is that the higher you, uh, the, the further the chain has to drop, the higher the fountain will go, which is why I'm off the edge of the stage. But here is uh, Biggins now, standing at the top of a staircase at the Royal Society. There you go. Amazing. So there you go. Um, and uh, they, actually, by the way, they do really good stuff at rutherford-physics.org.uk. They, they, they took this sort of, uh, this unknown thing, this thing that no one understood, worked out the physics of it and realised that actually it's all, it's all Newtonian stuff. It's all stuff that you kind of do at A-level and early um, degree. So they've set it as a challenge for pupils and it's, and it's brilliant and they do loads of that stuff. So check out rutherford-physics.org.uk. So that's kind of, that's the full journey really from me kind of discovering this thing that I didn't have an explanation for via YouTube and slow motion cameras uh, to Cambridge and finally having an answer, which is amazing, except that for me it's like, what can I add now, you know? So I've decided to add what I always add when I've run out of ideas, which is dubstep. <laughs> Mold 
Perfect. 